From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Large language models already improving cyber attacks, Reseda gets decrypted, and the U.S. puts a bounty on Alf V slash Black Cat Associates. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have selected from this past week's cybersecurity headlines. It's like we went to a blockbuster on a Friday night. We were looking at all the great stuff. The seventh coin, get that out of here. We're going for the big ones. And now we're ready for some insight, opinion, and expertise from our guest, Trina Ford, the CISO at iHeartMedia. Trina, thank you so much for making the time being here. I cannot wait to get into the news with you. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> I am I am super pumped for the show. Lots of great stories. Before we jump into it, though, just have to thank our sponsor for today, Vanta, compliance that doesn't sock too much. Remember to join us on YouTube Live. To do so, go to CISOseries.com. You know the website. Hit the events drop down and look for that cybersecurity headlines week in review image, our iconic week in review image. You need to find it. You need to look for it. You need to click on it and then you can join us. And if you are joining us, we want your comments in our chat. Get on YouTube leave those comments. We love to hear from you and we'll respond to those. Any questions, comments, or concerns, I guess constructive criticism, maybe this isn't the appropriate venue, but any which way we want your comments. So we've got about 20 minutes. Let's jump into the news. Trina, I can't wait to talk about this. First one here, big news this week, big report that came out, threat actors using LLMs to improve cyber attacks. Microsoft and OpenAI released a report showing how they have observed threat actors using ChatGPT and other services to do things like improve scripts, perform research on victims, and refine social engineering approaches. The report saw this in use by state affiliated groups from Russia, North Korea, Iran, and China, you know, kind of the greatest hits of threat actors, uh, state affiliated threat actors. Microsoft said it didn't see any significant attacks using them yet, but then also warned about future AI use cases pointing to AI voice impersonation. Of course, you know, Trina, this was bound to happen. A lot of speculation when we first saw things like ChatGPT kind of become public. Uh, only a matter of time now before a serious breach or an act of cyber or an act of sabotage or theft comes from a well-executed AI-based technology. In fact, we, we just uh, last week covered uh, the $25 million deepfake heist uh, on the show. I'm curious, how can industry leaders like Microsoft and CISA help organizations and their leaders understand these technologies and prepare for AI-based attacks? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it has been one of those that I've thought about often, and I look at it from more of a two-pronged approach um, because the security leaders and professionals were fighting that good fight, you know, kind of from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. But there's an opportunity for both CISA and Microsoft to use their, their visibility, their budget, at least Microsoft's to um, really approach this from a the CEO, the leadership, the higher echelon within each company and really help them to understand. So maybe something quarterly or monthly, some type of, hey, let's get together an information share so that it's not just the security professionals who are talking about it, but also um, at, a, at a higher level, the, the leadership is talking about it as well. Um, at the end of the day, I think that Microsoft, I've been on calls before with CISA and Microsoft where they kind of information share, but mm -hmm. we need to be more deliberate about it, not just when something happens, but more often. And we need to hit each different level, not just um, critical infrastructure or, you know, Fortune 10 or, or 50. It should be across the board because it's um, it's a community. And if one of us is breached or hacked, it affects the economy as a whole. So yeah, that, yeah. that's a really great point of uh, you know Microsoft using their ability to speak outside of just the 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 security profession, right? Having the ear of of the rest of the C suite, essentially. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, something I hadn't considered. You know. It, it can be very easy for cybersecurity professionals to kind of get caught up, you know, in in their own in, in you know the more technical concerns or or thinking about you know these advanced use cases. And yeah, you're right. Microsoft getting out there and putting out stuff like this on a regular basis uh, could it very will help. Much. Some type of private channel, right? Yeah. You know, because everyone is at a different level of maturity with their programs mm -hmm. and their budgets and the investment in security. So keeping that in mind helping out at the different levels and in that tone from the top will really make a difference. All right. Well, our next story here, Reseda gets the decryption treatment. We're going to file this under good news here. A group of researchers from the Korean Internet and Security Agency, or 
Kissa disclosed a flaw in the ransomware encryption scheme used by Reseda, the, the Reseda threat group. Reseda launched operations in mid-2023, targeting healthcare organizations with intermittent encryption, kind of the uh, de rigueur technique of uh, ransomware actors. The researchers found that ransomware's random number generator used a 32-bit seed value from a system's current time. This limited scope allowed them to create a valid key to unencrypt the data, just eliminated a lot of possibilities that they looked for. Kissa released an automated decryption tool for Windows, as well as full technical documentations. Although if it's you know something that's influencing a non-Windows system, like a VMware host or something like that, uh, there is no tool for that yet. But it's always great to score a win against threat actors, especially when you know playing the type of uh, you know the, the high game of uh, of ransomware like this. I'm curious, how could Kissa or CISA or other make a big or bigger noise about this perhaps to dissuade other groups or is that not possible in your view trina i looked at it a little differently i was thinking let's not make noise silent but deadly right Mm -hmm. Um, i think part of our challenge is we publicize too much and um, the bad actors watch the news they they look at the internet right at the end of the day the way I was kind of looking at it is we have to be a little bit more strategic in in how we approach um, trying to make sure that we are at least at a minimum keeping up. We're never going to be ahead of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And and again, it's about in, in just in my opinion, research, it's about utilizing the intelligence. And it's also about making sure that we keep an eye across the board on the small, medium sized business, as well as those enterprise and we look at opportunities to um, maybe educate and share a little bit more. Yeah. So. Yeah, I kind of had that same thought of this was a national ransomware change your random number rate, <laughs> random number generator <laughs> seed value day, because I'm pretty sure as soon as that came out, that's exactly what it did. But still, I, like, I, I, you know, it's easy to, to think that. And I think that's a point well taken. Uh, but hey, if you if you were a victim, um, having that decryptor out there is not uh, an insignificant uh, win for those people. Either. No, it's not. And we don't want to entice. It might come down to um, catch me, stop me if you can. Right. <laughs> Who's smarter? And it'll get worse versus better. I'm just I just believe in silent, but mm-hmm. deadly. Do our thing behind the scenes. And when it gets back to your point of, you know, maybe this is where Microsoft or CISA having back channels with, you know, Fortune 500 or private industry would uh, would be a key there as well. Exactly. All right. Next story here. U.S. government puts a bounty on Alf V and Black Cat Associates. This week, the U.S. Department of State announced a reward of up to $10 million for information leading to the identification or location of leaders of the group behind Alf V slash Black Cat ransomware. It also is offering rewards of up to $5 million for information leading to the arrest or conviction of those participating or conspiring or attempting to participate in Alf V or Black Cat ransomware. This follows up on a December takedown of the group's operations. The announcement said that over 1,000 vict- uh, victim entities globally have been compromised by Alf V. So, Trina, this could uh, open the uh, could, this could open up the market in which bounties and rewards become, I guess, more attractive to individual employees of threat groups. Right? Uh, they're you know looking for a big payday, shaking the code of silence or internal trust within these organizations. I'm curious, do you, do you see any ways that this could be gamed or abused or, or do you think this bounty system, you know, I mean, this isn't the first bounty that's been out there, but one of the biggest ones I've seen, uh, can it work? I think it can work. It Look, let's let's take a chance. Let's do it. Right. There's there's a few key aspects here. We're coming together globally mm-hmm. and we're collaborating. That speaks volumes. Um, can it be abused? Yeah, it can. But the goal here is disruption. At least that's the way I looked at it. Let's disrupt, make them unproductive. If you don't trust, it starts to make you unproductive. They'll start not to trust each other. Um, Someone may turn. I'm Mm -hmm. thinking so because money and food always motivate us. So at the end of the day, um, we can also use this opportunity if someone from the threat group does go for the the bounty or the reward to find out a little bit more about their intel. And from that perspective, I do believe that it could work. So. Yep. We, we will have to see it because uh, I enjoy that the the government is using all the tools at its disposal, right? It's it's working with law enforcement to to take down a lot of these, you know, do sophisticated sting operations, but it's also like, hey, 
if you, if you help us out, <laughs> there could be a payday for you too. Um, so yeah, using every tool at their disposal for sure uh, is is going to be key to to kind of this this fight going forward. Agreed. All right, next up here, New Jersey law enforcement sues data brokers. Last week, 118 class action lawsuits were filed against data brokers who allegedly failed to respond to requests from roughly 20,000 New Jersey law enforcement personnel who asked for their personal information to be removed from the Internet. New Jersey law prohibits the disclosure of home addresses and unpublished phone numbers for current and retired police officers, prosecutors and judges, along with their family members. The law, known as Daniel's Law, was passed after a New Jersey federal judge's 20-year-old son was shot at uh, shot to death at her home in 2020 by disgruntled attorneys. Really horrible stuff. The suits are seeking $1,000 for each violation, plus punitive damages and attorney's fees that could cost data brokers at least $20 million and hit the industry as a whole by at least $2.3 billion in fines. So, Trina, a, a lot of setup there, but we needed to provide that background. Uh, you pointed out to us, though, in pre-production that this story is close to your heart. Uh, I, I'm curious, why is that? And do you feel Daniel's Law is a chance to of, you know, uh, of kind of uh, living up to its promise in the wild world of data brokers? So I do feel like Daniel's Law will live up to its promise. I, I definitely hope so. That is for sure. Um, the one I think may not is the need for more of a comprehensive privacy or federal law that just, we just don't seem to be getting there. But um, this one does hit near and dear because too much of our information is 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 available and, and it's not always used um, according to the expectation. Let's just say that you walk home, you walk up to your door and someone's standing at your door that you thought you just left at the grocery store, but they happen to be behind you in the, in the line and they look up your name and next thing you know, you can see where you live, your information. It's very easy to obtain um, data these days. And I get it. Um, it's lucrative. It's a lucrative business, but there should be some regulation behind it. And I get it. There's the data broker registry now and some a lot of the states are, are following suit. Um, and there are some regulations for the data brokers. I'm hoping that it um, takes flight and more states follow suit and it gets more stringent because consumers are forced to provide their data. Anytime we want to do something, we're, we have to provide our data and we don't have much say in how it's used here. So, you know, I'm thinking that at the end of the day, hopefully data brokers at a minimum are starting to be more heavily regulated and you know, not for nothing, maybe one day they see what it feels like for your data to be sold like that and for your families to be threatened. Yeah. When it comes to those real world impacts, I mean, there, there's the base level right to privacy considerations. But when it comes to exactly. personal safety, I think that frames it in a way that really, you know, shows uh, the, 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 impl the implications that these uh, uh, data brokers and, and selling of data can have. Um, we've covered on uh, cybersecurity headlines a lot of the updates that have been coming to uh, CCPA, uh, some of the stuff mm -hmm. that's been going on in Vermont, Illinois, and stuff like that. So uh, be sure you are checking out cybersecurity headlines every single day. Uh, and as we get more stories of, of you know, whether it's you know, in New Jersey or California or wherever, um, uh, we'll, we'll keep you up to date on kind of the latest in that. That's definitely one of the beats we're keeping a beat on. Uh, before we move on to our next story, though, we have to spend a few moments and hear a word from our sponsor for today, Vanta. From dozens of spreadsheets and screenshots to fragmented tools and manual security reviews, managing the requirements for modern compliance and security programs is increasingly challenging. Vanta is the leading trust management platform that helps you centralize your efforts to establish trust and enable growth across your organization. Over 6,000 companies partner with Vanta to automate compliance, strengthen security posture, streamline security reviews, and reduce third-party risk. To learn more, go to vanta.com slash CISO and watch their three-minute product demo. All right, our next story here, 23andMe blames users for <laughs> Definitely one of the uh, uh, ones that stood out to me this week. It was a great move. In the ongoing saga of last October's data breach that impacted nearly 7 million people, the genetic tracing company, 23andMe, is now blaming its customers, especially the, uh, those taking legal action against it, as people who negligently recycled and failed to update their passwords. One expert, a professor of comparative policy at the University of Vienna and a 23andMe customer, described the company's response as almost a textbook case 
of how things should not be done. Uh, it should be noted that 23andMe, which New York Magazine writer Lisa Miller calls the Google of spit, now requires two-factor authentication for all users, although that was added after the breach happened and the subsequent lawsuits began. So, so Trina, you know, we can look at how 23andMe handled the issue, blaming users uh, and discounting potential damage from leaked material. Uh, you know, a lot of this was caused by a credential stuffing attack. I, I'm curious, who do you feel is more responsible, the company or the customers? I, I can understand from behind closed doors where you say, our customers shouldn't reuse passwords. I thought <laughs> that they would say that. I understand there's a legal case, so there's some liability there. What lessons does this teach other companies dealing with breaches, though? Like, what, what should be the takeaway? So the takeaway, don't blame the customers. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it, look, the customers are about the product. They're they're not concerned about what you're supposed to be doing behind the scenes. Because at the end of the day, the there's an expectation that I, your data is protected by the company that you're sharing your data with. So there's an expectation of defense in depth, layered security, that you have uh, risk management or operational risk teams that will help you understand the different scenarios and make sure that you're prioritizing how you are uh, protecting data. Customers, yes, they may not have recycled their or changed their passwords, but at the end of the day, end of the day it's it's about the product for them. And there's an, again that expectation. I think that at this point, the cut the organization let down the the customer. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one thing to say people reuse passwords, but like also that should be part of your of your risk modeling for this, right? So mm -hmm. that that a compromised credential isn't going to completely expose people in the way that they were linking to to relatives and stuff like that opened up people that weren't 23andme customers to having data leaked as well so yeah like again it's one thing to say did customers maybe not follow best practices sure but that does yeah that, that doesn't excuse a company from not uh you know kind of uh, uh allowing people to fail gracefully when it comes to uh, password hygiene right absolutely and again it goes to that expectation Otherwise, don't force us to give our information. Yeah, well, <laughs> well yeah. they, they didn't force it in this case, but, you know, don't offer it. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, next up here, CISA releases repository security framework. CISA is partnered with the Open Source Security Foundation, securing software repositories working group. Oof, that is quite a name to release a framework. This lays out four security maturity levels for package repositories across the categories of command line tools, authorization, authentication, and general capabilities. These have a range of level zero for meaning very little maturity to level three, and this lays out things like having MFA for all maintainers. The researchers say all package management systems should work at at least level one right now. So Trina, this looks like a positive initiative from CISA in an area that's seen to share vulnerabilities and mistakes. We're all thinking about uh, uh, so the software supply chain and particularly uh, when it comes to open source. I'm curious your thoughts. Uh, do you know, does this have a possibility of catching on? I think it does. I, I always applaud CISA for working with different groups. They see something, it's kind of like see something, say something. They see something, they try to do something. And a, a lot of times smaller companies and even large ones don't know where to start. They don't know how to measure themselves, where to begin. And a framework is good guidance. And it allows the company and or the security teams or risk teams to decide which part is applicable to their type of operating model. So I do. Um, and plus, uh, open source is, you know, the weak link, at least from when I used to grow up with it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely considered the weak link. But um, again, I do I, I do think that it will catch on because other frameworks have and it just takes some. Um, it takes one. It, it just takes one company and or one group to say, hey, this is working for me. This is how we did it. And it usually catches on pretty quick. All right. And our last story of today, QNAP vulnerability disclosures send mixed messages. 
The Taiwanese network attached storage company has found itself at odds with security researchers after releasing fixes for two new command injection vulnerabilities. Uh, the argument comes down to one rating of uh, to to uh, rating of severity. QNAP has assigned both vulnerabilities with a score of uh, five point eight, so not very uh, severe there. Claiming exploitation would require a high complexity attack with low impact if successful. But Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 stated that they had a low complexity of attack and critical impact to IoT devices, which you could argue a NAS device uh, kind of falls into. So Trina, the standoff went a little further, but essentially we see a security company holding a manufacturer accountable. And QNEP has definitely had its, its share of, uh, of security black eyes over the years. As a CISO, who would you trust more? And are there important regulations that could also force such due diligence? Absolutely. The security company, <laughs> because they don't have an ulterior motive, nothing to gain at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the manufacturer, the vendor does. Now, are there are there regulations? Probably. I look at it like this. Um, the FCC holds broadcasters and advertisements um, accountable. Right. For the information that they're sharing and the products that they're putting out there. So I would be hard pressed to believe that there's not giving all the other regulations something out there that can govern govern manufacturers and vendors like this and in situations like this. Yeah, I, I, I'm honestly surprised this doesn't uh, uh, come up to the surface more. I think a part of it is, like I said, QNIP has had all sorts of problems with, uh, you know, end of life hardware and ransomware and all that kind of stuff over the years. But yeah, this this idea of you know these these companies, uh, especially if you're you're more on the white label side. Uh, of stuff where you're not necessarily public traded and might not run to follow mm -hmm. the SEC or something like that, where we see these these kind of uh, uh, um, disputed uh, bug severities and stuff like that. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it also, I mean, it does no good for QNAP other than to pr temporarily present a, a black eye or something like that. But, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, if vulnerability is bad, your, your customers are going to find out, right? Exactly. See, sometimes it's not about whether they're regulated or not. It's about expectations of your customers and partners. And you get that black eye, they start not to, there's, there's then the concern about trust. Yeah. So that, that, that definitely, uh, uh, certainly speaks to that uh, for sure. Before we get out of here, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, point out uh, Kobe Kulader uh, in LinkedIn, uh, uh, where we broadcast the stream as well. I uh, brought a point about 23andMe. He said the question kind of for him is, uh, you know, who's to blame the thief or those who let the thief steal? He says uh, it's the regulator and legislator who let 23andMe be negligent for such high sensitivity data. Yeah. When you get into biometrics, that does tend to, uh, uh, you know, kind of set everybody off, uh, right on that. That's like a, you know, <laughs> you, you can't change that stuff. Right. So like th there is, there is another level of expectation there. I think like that. And as Michael Vending says, especially for DNA or biometrics, you can't change like a password or even a social security number. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, Kobe, thank you so much. Uh, and Michael, uh, for those two great points, really appreciate it. And also, uh, thank you so much, uh, Trina Ford for all of your great points throughout the course of the show. Before we get out of here, was there a story that you reacted strongly to? Like ones that you, you just, you really loved that we talked about or just made your, your eyes roll to the back of your head? 23 and me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it does come back to that. I mean, that's a move. Uh, I'm just going to yeah. say that's a move. Yeah. I, my only hope for that is that's that's their lawyers and like their lawyers, like you have to say this, otherwise we're admitting liability or something like that. Because I can't see anyone <laughs> that is like has to deal with customers yeah. uh, uh, approving that statement. I cannot, I cannot fathom that. Yeah, that doesn't bode well. Not popular yes. at all. Yeah. For for sure. But what does bode well uh, is following Trina Ford on the cyberspace. So Trina, where can people find you online? They can find me on LinkedIn. Fantastic. We will have yeah. a link to that in the show notes. And is iHeartMedia hiring right now? We are. I and am. <laughs> we will have a link to that as well. So if you're interested in some of those roles, be sure to check out our show notes. And thank you so much once again, Trina Ford, the CISO at iHeartMedia. She would know about the jobs. Uh, thank you again. Uh, bringing the great takes. Appreciate your perspective, uh, your wisdom, and your time uh, today on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thanks also to our sponsor for today, Vanta Compliance. That doesn't suck too much. Also, thanks to our audience today. You know, we can't always get to every comment, put it up on the screen, but we really appreciate you being here and make sure you're coming back every single week. Remember, it's 3.30 p.m. Eastern. If you haven't joined us for a live one, 
it is a lot of fun. Uh, we we like to keep it fast and loose. Good times. We'll be back next week also with another Super Cyber Game Show Friday, as well as another week in review show. So uh, you have your Friday live streams covered with the CISO series. And if that's not enough for you, you can still get your daily news fix through cybersecurity headlines every single day. Give us about six minutes and we'll get you all caught up. Until the next time we meet, I'm Rich Straffolino, reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.